Thank you for joining us this evening to welcome Dr. Brian Roby to Austin. I'm Karen Grumberg, the Israel Studies Faculty Coordinator at the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies and the Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors for this event, the Department of History, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies, and the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. We are grateful for your support. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to let you know about our next Israel Studies event, scheduled for one week from today. Dr. Leora Halpern of the University of Washington will give a talk entitled, The Oldest Guard, Landowners, Local Memory, and the Making of the Zionist Settler Past. That's on Monday, November 14th, from 4 to 5 p.m. on Zoom. You can go to the Schusterman Center website to register. And now for this evening's speaker. Dr. Brian Roby is an assistant professor of Judaic studies at the Frankel Institute at the University of Michigan, where he is also affiliated with the African Studies Center and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies. After earning his PhD at the University of Manchester in the UK, Dr. Roby completed a postdoctoral fellowship at NYU and was a visiting fellow at the University of Michigan's Frankel Institute for Judaic Studies. His research focuses on Middle Eastern and North African Jewish history in the modern era. Specifically, his interests include the intersection of race, gender, and sexuality in Israel-Palestine, 19th and 20th century North African history, and the legacy of French colonialism on Arab and Jewish identity. His first book is titled The Mizrahi Era of Rebellion, Israel's Forgotten Civil Rights Struggle, 1948 to 1966. Published in 2015 by Syracuse University Press, the book provides an extensive history of social justice protests by Middle Eastern Jews in Israel. His second book project, related I believe to his talk today, explores the shifting boundaries of racial constructs in Israel-Palestine, as well as African-American intellectual contributions to Israeli sociology and theories on race and ethnicity. Dr. Roby is also currently working on the intellectual production of North African Jewish literary figures and political activists associated with the Haskalah and the Nahta, respect, respectively the Jewish and Arab Enlightenment movements in the early to mid 20th century. Dr. Roby's talk today is titled Israeli Blackness in Motion, Transnational Perspectives on Jewish Racial Difference. Welcome Dr. Roby, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you so much for that introduction and now it's following you. So um, <laughs> I may have to ask you to step out of the room for a second. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Bear with us everyone. Okay, just go on. Oh, just wait one second. Now, there we go. Come on back. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I'll try to keep this fairly informal. Um, given, you know, the uh, constraints of our uh, pandemic situation that we're all in, and you should recognize that. Um, and of course, thank you so much for having me here um, at UT Austin. It's a pleasure. My first time in Texas, actually. Um, and today I'll be talking about race relations in, uh, in Israeli society uh, with regard to Middle Eastern Jews um, called Mizrahim. Um, recently, uh, I've, I've kind of uh, started thinking more about uh, labeling or using the term Afro-Asian Jews, um, particularly because it um, shows this connection that's really and um, foundational for understanding how Jews um, from Africa and Asia related to anti-colonialism, um, as well as a more transnational struggle uh, involving uh, Africans and Asians. Um, and the reason why I particularly like this term over Mizrahim, at least in English, um, is because I think a lot of times when we talk about Mizrahim or Afro-Asian Jews, we kind of divorce them from the rest of the world. We just think of them in this vacuum within Israeli society as if they didn't exist before, and they don't exist outside of uh, Israeli uh, Zionist society in particular. Um, so I'll be talking about them as well as Ashkenazim a little bit. Um, I'm highlighting uh, how Afro-Asian Jews became black um, prior to the establishment of Israel in 1948, um, and how blackness has inflected the, the uh, Israeli experience throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. I'll conclude with some reflections on how our understandings of Israeli Jewish racial constructs influence current day societal issues. Um, and of course, this is all part of my second book project, and 
I need to remember to do this. There's a lot of uh, technology going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, all right, yeah, that thing too. <laughs> um, which is tentative uh, titled uh, Israel, the Israel through a colored lens, uh, a racial constructs in the Israeli Jewish imagination, where it's for the origins of this racialized division between Jewish communities within the era of modernity. The heart of my research, I deal with this question of, if, as many scholars assert, race is a construct, a social construct, then what are its building blocks? What can Israel, a relatively new society, teach us about how racial constructs are formed and changed over time and place? Um, and of course, I'm going beyond this centuries-old question of, are the Jews a race? And rather, I delve deeper into the implications of understanding the processes involved with creating a black white color division um, between Jews um, through this exploration of these shifting boundaries between Jewishness and Arabness, whiteness and Jewishness, and blackness and Jewishness, um, centered around Israel Palestine. And so I explore the relationship between blackness, Jewishness, and the intersections of race and gender expression in the Middle East through this work. Um, and I try to shed light on the legacies of the sometimes problematic and sometimes emancipatory usage of black thought within Israeli Jewish society. Um, while Jewish and Israel studies scholars have borrowed from critical race theory, um, this often comes with this caveat that um, it, it, there are few analogies um, to make between a black diaspora and Middle Eastern Jews, um, something with which I firmly disagree. Um, and through this examination of race, um, the book tries to explore the migration history of people's ideas and these social constructs. Some key themes at play are the interplay of return or aliyah um, to and from Israel, um, as I term it, aliyah to and from Israel, and Israeli consciousness, um, diasporic exilic belonging uh, to multiple places, and how gender and race um, are performed and received in different times and space, focusing specifically on Afro-Asian Jews. Um, I oftentimes use the metaphor of travel uh, throughout the book in its various manifestations uh, to investigate the meaning of Blackness through travel writings, transnational intellectual history, transgressive, transgressive migration, and most significantly, the migration of Blackness across the Mediterranean. So really, a, a lot of my work is trying to put a Jewish study in conversation with Black studies, as well as critical race studies, and understanding um, Jewishness, not just in the Americas, or not just in Israel, but as part of a, a, a kind of global Black thought um, that has been going on for a few centuries now. So today's talk um, delves in just into a few major themes of the project and is divided into three parts. First, I start off with a vignette of Ida Jiggetts, who's a black scholar in the 1950s, who serves as a kind of Janus figure in the book um, that will bring us back to the origins of racialization of Afro-Asian Jews, um, which I argue began in the early 20th century Zionist engagement with scientific racism and colonial racial structures. Um, in the second part, I briefly return to Ida Jiggetts in the 1950s to so demonstrate how Black Americans produce knowledge of Afro-Asian Jews and were themselves influenced by Afro-Asian Jewish thought about their own positionality um, within uh, Israeli society. Um, here, I just have um, on this slide kind of a general guide of where the book is headed at this point. I kind of start off with the lexicon of race, um, particularly that one um, is part of my own uh, obsession, I would call it, with um, etymologies, um, particularly regarding uh, the word geza, um, or race in Hebrew, and why we can talk about, literally, as Bali Barber put it, in Hebrew, we can talk about uh, uh, racism without race. So we talk about geza nus, racism. Oh, yes. Oh, oh it's, yeah, it's slipping down here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about racism. Can you try turning it off? It's the volumes for oh, it's going up and down. Try just turning it off and see if the room works better. Let's see. Uh, is it off now? Yeah, it's off now. How about now? Is that better? That's just better. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about for those in the back? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Okay. So I'll just like leave this be. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so yeah, in Hebrew, we can talk about literally like uh, gizanut or racism, but not about what races we're talking about, right? Uh, we, we talk about, uh, for, for instance, the edot, 
particularly for the non-European community or the ethnicities. Um, and what kind of work does that do or what does it hide um, that's what's going on within uh, Israeli Jewish consciousness when we do that, when we, when we don't use, when we either like pretend like it's not an issue of racism or institutionalized racism, um, and we don't understand where these origins of these racial divisions come from. Um, and in the third part, I will um, talk about this forgotten scandal in the 1970s um, involving the migration of Moroccan and Iraqi Jews back to Morocco and Iraq um, uh, under Saddam Hussein and then uh, Sultan at the time in Morocco. Um, and if time permitting, um, I conclude with contemporary reflections of Afro-Asian uh, Israeli Jewish poetry uh, in the present day. This is now uh, chapter six there, the coda, in a sense, um, that deals with these issues of gender, race, and sexuality um, for Afro-Asian Jews, particularly those from uh, Yemen and Ethiopia. All right, so to start off, um, just for those in the audience who may not be aware, there are kind of three basic racial divisions within uh, the Jewish communities within Israel. One being Ashkenazim, who are considered white in a sense, uh, European origin Jews. Um, they have traditionally or historically maintained political and socioeconomic power uh, within Israel. Uh, Mizrahim or Afro-Asian Jews are considered black. Um, really a completely diverse group of uh, Jews from two different continents, um, speaking numerous different languages that have kind of been thrown together into a non-European Black category. Um, most migrated between 1950 and 1970. And then there's this third category of the Beta Israel, um, Ethiopian Jews or Ethiopian origin Jews, uh, present-day Ethiopia, because some were also from what is now Eritrea. Um, and most migrated, uh, but not all, in the late 70s until actually the present day to a lesser extent, but um, from the late, uh, late 70s to the 90s. There are also, I must point this out, that there were Ethiopian Jews who migrated to Palestine prior to the State of Israel and during the beginning of the State of Israel as well. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, another one is that how do we think of Blackness? I think the immediate thing um, for many, if not most people, globally speaking, um, who don't engage with these kind of questions, is that we assume, okay, it's about skin color, right? Um, black means that they have black skin. Nobody in the world has black skin. We all have some kind of color. Black is the absence or, yeah, the, wait, the other way around. <laughs> yes. But you get what I'm saying. <laughs> no one is the color of my jacket right now. Right. Um, and to do so, to think about skin color, I, I really love this quote by Michelle Wright um, in Physics of Blackness, that blackness cannot be located on the body because of the diversity of bodies that claim blackness as an identity. And she goes further to point out that if we try to locate blackness on the body, all we're doing is reproducing the same type of biological determinism that was so prevalent uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century of scientific racism. Right. Um, and here we have 30 Shades of Black, which is a really wonderful Afro femme march um, that takes place mostly in Paris, but throughout France as well. Um, and then you have basically 30 Shades of Black uh, in, this, in this image of like black women from various different uh, countries, uh, origins, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. The other thing, um, and this is all just a little introduction, I'm going to try to make this a lot shorter. Um, when we talk about Afro-Asian Jews, these are the major Jewish cities uh, in the early 20th century where uh, Jews live. So we have from, of course, as far west as Morocco. I did not include the Americas because that gets way too confusing uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and then we have uh, Eastern Africa and Yemen, um, and as far east as Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, um, which are also kind of part of this community of Jews as well. Okay, so before I get to that, I think I can do that. Is that, no, that doesn't do it. That does what look at. So I want to start with Ida Jacobs. Um, while in Israel, one of the first incidents that uh, she recalled in her travel memoir called Israel to me is her difficulty in understanding uh, how she was racially marked differently, um, and, or at least in different ways than what she was used to in the US. 
Um, she was often mistaken for being a Yemenite Jew, um, both because of her skin tone and because of her hair texture. Um, and she recalls one particular incident in which she was walking down the street in Jerusalem and she heard children yelling, kushi, kushi. Um, and uh, this word is, uh, you know, it has this like the, the strength and ugliness of the N word in English. Um, and so she grabbed one of the boys, assuming that she they were talking to her. And she said, well, why did you call me that? that? You know, that's really rude. I'm a nice lady. You know, I'm a grown up. Why would you do that? And this boy said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, ma'am. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to him. I was calling him a kushi, pointing to this Yemenite, uh, young Yemenite Jewish boy. Um, as she interviewed him, uh, as she put it, um, the blonde-haired child uh, she found out was the son of American parents, and he had almost immediately, from a very young age, translated and then transposed his understandings of blackness in the U.S. onto those of that of Yemenite Jews in Israel. So, how did he learn this word, and why did he think it was appropriate to call Yemenite Jews that? So, the first part of the talk um, is kind of based around that little vignette, um, and. I want to discuss how did Mizrahim or Afro-Asian Jews become Black when they weren't that at, at all, right? Um, and what I've found so far is that really it comes from this long intellectual history um, that one shaped Jigit's knowledge of uh, Afro-Asian Jews, but also shaped our own knowledge. And by our own, I mean American and Israeli uh, kind of Jewish concepts of racial divisions, even if we don't call it that. Um, and that's really scientific racism, unfortunately. <laughs> and there's several bad men uh, that are part of this, constructing that. Um, these are the four big ones that I, I really focus on throughout the book. And one is Arthur Rubin, uh, born in 1876. He's a German social Darwinist, um, foundational Jewish demographer. Uh, if we think about some of the issues faced uh, in the present day with Jewish demography, uh, and those who lead it, um, he was one of those, I must say that. Uh, Nahum Shalush, a lesser known character, um, who is an ethno historian, uh, archaeologist, and also French colonial spy, created the epistemologies of how and what we understand about North African Jewish history. Uh, Yitzhak Minsvi, ethnographer of Jews in Palestine, and then later the second president of Israel, and then Shlomo Goiten, uh, German ethnographer, probably the most famous of them all, I would say, um, of Jews in the Arabian Peninsula specifically. So most of these people, we don't actually think of them as like, you know, scientific races, but they very much were. And half of them, if not all of them, really explicitly saw themselves as engaged in scientific racism. Although, you know, it wasn't called that at the time. Um, this is kind of what they were doing. Um, at the time, really, uh, at least in the German speaking world, uh, there was this notion of uh, what what they called race mania throughout Europe. Um, and all of them, you know, caught the bug in a sense. A really unfortunate sickness. Okay. So, one major part of constructing race glo globally. Um, involved this colonial uh, European practice of travel writing. And for the Zionist movement, this translated into this popular engagement with knowing the land, or Yedidat Aris in Hebrew. Um, as we now know, a land is rarely without a people. So the act of knowing the land also entails knowing and tracing the boundaries of its people, their ethnicities and their races. Such practices invented and reshaped ethnic identities and racial identities through a form of, of epistemological violence that produced non-native histories of Jews from the global south. One must remember that prior to the 1917 Balfour Declaration, various other homelands were considered by uh, the Zionist movement, um, the Uganda plan being the most infamous or was well, well-known one. Um, but there are, of course, other plans, which included Libya as a potential homeland for Jews, Morocco, Iraq, uh, Galveston, Texas, as well. Uh, so, yeah, never been there, but uh, I would not imagine that uh, it would be very uh, welcoming to Israeli Jews uh, at the moment. Um, and um, these are actually serious considerations. I, I have to emphasize that um, as alternatives to Jewish settlement in Palestine. 
Um, and and Hongshuus was very much a part of this. He was one of the main leaders of it, um, particularly in carrying out the scientific reports to see which lands were actually feasible to live in. And then not just feasible, but then who are the people that should live there first, right? Um, so um, through his scientific missions, which um, were backed by the Ottoman, French, and British authorities uh, or empires, um, were carried out between 1902 and 1914. And through them, we get a glimpse into how some European Jews understood the racialized otherness of Afro-Asian Jewry. Uh, one of the main failures of the Uganda plan was that there was little explicit connections between Jews and the land of East Africa, at least for Europeans, um, in order to convince enough Eastern Europeans to actually move there. But they did see the ancient histories of Babylonia and Cyrenica, present-day Iraq and Libya, as really great myth-making areas um, for a new Jewish homeland. Um, Nahum Shalouz, called the Marco Polo of Hebrew literature, um, would carry these out on behalf of, on behalf of uh, Lyoté, the uh, French resident general of Morocco, but also was called the empire builder or empire maker for uh, France, um, as well as um, being uh, under the auspices of the Zionist institutions who partially funded him, but not completely. Um, although he was doing this as science, um, his actual main um, themes in his work was that um, this search for primordial origin of the Jewish people. Um, and Jewish ties to the lands of the Middle East and Africa in particular. Um, his active time in North Africa in 1904 and 1916 was during this period in which uh, the Zionist movement wasn't quite sure if Palestine was going to work out. Um, and that's still a question mark at this moment, I would say, or at least some would say, I would say. Um, um, but the most important thing was to find a refuge for European Jews. And what Schluss found most exciting was not the Jewish people of North Africa, um, with whom he oftentimes depicted with disgust, um, but the ability of pre-modern Jewish history to recreate a glorious Jewish past of valor and strength, both in the Roman era and then later in Andalusian Spain. So he really cared very little about the, the human beings that were living in these areas, but he loved this idea that you could use their past to galvanize the Jewish community and create a new Jewish man through that history. Um, so what that does is actually frees the Jews who live there into a um, kind of predetermined medieval period rather than actually engaging with them as if they you know, exist uh, during the time that he was living. So a few of the quotes here. Um, is uh, the first one here is when he's talking about this um, historical past of uh, Jews within Africa. And he says, uh, particularly for the Jewish warrior class, as he calls them, called them, uh, their influence is to be met um, with throughout the entire Atlas, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, uh, in Ethiopia, and in the Sudan, where the descendants of the Jews of Zerenica, meaning Libya, um, founded empires, Judaized the natives, and civilized the country. Neither Greeks, nor Romans, nor Arabs have succeeded in repeopling it again. It is as, it, it is as if, though, uh, it were awaiting its valiant Jewish aboriginals. So that's really an important thing to kind of sit with and kind of think through what he's doing here in terms of rhetoric. You know, it's not just that he's dismiss, dismissing modern Jewish history in Africa, but he's also creating this idea of a land without people, right? Um, this land is just waiting for these um, uh, amazing Eastern European potential Jewish warriors to come in and just take it over. Um, and it's, of course, strikingly similar to how Palestine is described um, at the time um, in Zionist literature. Uh, once he actually met North African Jews, um, which took him some time, uh, be primarily because his interlocutors were um, part of the Ottoman Empire, did not believe he was Jewish um, because of the way he acted, the way he looked. They thought he was just a Christian. Um, he took note of their strength and virility, and oftentimes in homoerotic terms for the men, and would call them consistently throughout his notebooks and in his books, um, they were well-built, fine specimens of humanity. 
Um, but the one idea that possessed me, him, uh, was how to keep them from getting too close to me um, because he found them to be just detestable, you know, kind of, uh, gross people. He then went on to describe Libyan Jews in particular as grimy urchins um, with half uh, little brown, brown girls, half naked, their black eyes flashed out of black circles composed of flies that clung to them without causing them any discomfort. This is the scourge of the African Jew, caused by his disregard of even the elements of cleanliness and by constant exposure to sand and sun. It's important to note that these writings by Salus uh, translated into practice um, through the institution of selected uh, migration policies that were done by uh, Arthur Rubin uh, based on Salus's work. Um, and they often created uh, the stereotypes that continue to persist um, throughout the 50s and 60s about North African Jews in particular. Um, and so during this period of time, North African Jews were often turned away from migration to Palestine, um, particularly due to assumptions that they suffered um, from uh, sexual diseases, in particular um, mental health issues and trachoma, which is a form of eye disease. Um, and underlying his text called Travels in North Africa um, is this early 20th century uh, scientific racialist understanding of North African Jews. He's really intent on discovering which communities are able-bodied enough to be natural manual laborers so that Eastern European Jews uh, may later settle parts of Libya and of Morocco. At its core, it's this work that not only describes the racial differences between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, but also depicts his search for black and brown Jewish bodies who could work the land of North Africa should the settlement of Palestine not work out. Um, for Jewish men, he pointed out the, their virility and strength, and sometimes, and oh, actually really often, uh, homoerotic terms, uh, uh, undertones, which I'm not going to get into because it's slightly uncomfortable to discuss, uh, for me at least. <laughs> uh, while for Moroccan women, he lauded their cleanliness and their lighter skin tones, seeing them as these people who could possibly mate with Eastern European Jewish men, in particular, but not the men. Um, because you saw them as a kind of lost cause, in a sense. Um, long story short for him is that he had this kind of schism with the Alliance Israelite of Basel, in which he saw them, uh, at least for him, they saw him as someone who was trying to get the Jews to do things that they didn't want him to do, right? Uh, the Alliance wanted Jews to be more civilized in the French model. He wanted them to be more natural manual laborers. And eventually, um, that led to him being kicked out of Morocco by Leote himself. Just uh, being very cognizant of the time here. Uh, so along with others, um, there's one other case that I actually um, will talk about, um, just to kind of get the sense of epistemological violence, um, where the epistem is violent itself, even if we don't see it that way, um, and how it travels with ease throughout the Middle East, um, or at least throughout Europe and the, and the West, um, where it's mediated by experts seeing, seeking to advance a, a sort of savior narrative that emerged from, in the context of mass migration. So, for instance, for Yemenite Jews from 1948 to 1951, um, about 50,000 Jews from the Arabian Peninsula migrated to the state of Israel with the assistance of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, British and local Muslim authorities, um, the state of Israel, and the Jewish Agency. So, lots of institutions involved with this. Um, it is known as Operation Magic Carpet, with all its Orientalist notions of it. And I recently discovered at the American Jewish Archives a recorded interview with one of the American pilots um, who actually led this. Um, I listened to it. It was really fascinating um, just to hear how he received his knowledge about Jews outside of Europe. Um, and so the entire time he says that, like, I was told, I was told. And I was wondering, wait, who told you this? Um, and really, it was state authorities in Israel or government officials. Um, and he was told that they were so incredibly nomadic that they had never lived in anything but a tent. And I wonder about this. I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't really make sense. Um, but it would for him, because this is an American pilot who's Christian, has no clue, doesn't speak Arabic or Hebrew. 
and he's coming into Yemen for the first time, or the Arabian Peninsula, and all he sees is a bunch of people gather up in tents without realizing that they had migrated and had been forcibly, somewhat forcibly placed in these tents um, because there was no other alternative on their way to Israel. But he created an image for him that he later spread to American Jewish communities that like, oh, that's how they live forever, right? Uh, which is kind of fascinating in a sense, uh, at least for me. Um, and um, what he was told by the Israeli authorities prior to his arrival in Yemen was that his purpose for the trip was to, quote, redeem one of the lost tribes of Israel who were being slaughtered in Yemen and would have their throats cut in an Arab society that was nothing in comparison to anything we know in civilization. Of course, those who were waiting this transportation to Israel were placed in the British Crown colony of Aden, and these camps were built and supervised by the State of Israel, along with the Jewish Distribution Committee, um, which suffered from mismanagement at a scale that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of Jews from starvation and illness at the time. So uh, that's all to say that following these, uh, these exploits into Africa and Arabia, I contend that as Orientalists, they were really the most responsible for the production of European Jewish knowledge on Afro-Asian Jews. Um, and many of these stereotypes surrounding North African Jews in Israel stem from American and German understandings of the global Negro in particular, um, as well as Ashkenazi Jewish anthropological investigations of the existence of a Jewish race. This was a huge, huge question at the time um, and still kind of is implicitly at the moment. Um, as well as colonial French narratives uh, concerning North African masculinity and femininity. So just to give you a sense of this, uh, all right, I should, right, it follows me. That. <laughs> um, just to give you a sense, so this is a book um, by Morris Fishberg, um, who is a post-origin uh, American Jew, um, who wrote a book about the study of race and environment. Um, here, you can see one of the images that he uses, um, this is his own caption, is that she is a fat Jewess in Tunis and native costume. Um, and this was widely distributed. I cannot emphasize that enough. This is like probably one of the first times that American Jews would have seen other Jewish communities beyond Europe, right? And we have this that gives us a sense of how people understood Jewish, uh, Jewish femininity or Jewish gender um, in North Africa in particular. Now you may notice that here and here are the same young girl, right? But for some reason, we have this kind of more uh, aggressive stance for a Jewish woman. These are all postcards here um, that, are, that were distributed uh, throughout France and throughout Europe, um, done by uh, Landrock or a German studio. Um, and here we have a more aggressive figure as a Jewish woman and a more sexualized figure as an Arab woman, even though it is literally the same person in the same exact dress. Um, something similar here. And then again, um, presumably a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more manly in a sense, where we have Tunisian Jewish women who are sitting around smoking a cigarette, looking kind of like uh, more manly in a sense, at least for French sensibilities. Um, so that's all to say that there is this kind of mixture of both the visual and uh, kind of the literature um, creating this image in people's mindsets that really kind of like progress throughout um, this period of time. I'm gonna skip some of this. Um, and uh, how long am I doing at a time? Just that. 25 minutes. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Great, great, great. I'm looking at this thing and then this thing. And <laughs> I'm just like, uh, <laughs> no, I can't remember. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great. So I'm going to move on to Ida Jews and return to her. At the time, she's a black young, uh, young black social worker, um, NYU uh, PhD candidate student who enrolls at the Hebrew University in 1951 as a part of a trip sponsored um, by uh, Israel Workshop at the time. Um, it's still unclear to me at the moment um, who funded this Israel Workshop, um, but I have some guesses, but they're not substantiated by any evidence, uh, so I won't say that. Um, and 
she's writing her dissertation on the integration of Yemenite Jews into Israel in the 1950s. Um, her work in Israel comes within the context of Black internationalism, which from the 1940s to the 1960s saw tons of Black American scholars, activists, and artists from people like John, James Baldwin to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, make plans or actually visit um, Israel-Palestine. At this point, Black, Black American visitors um, saw affinities particularly with Afro-Asian Jews and not Palestinians at all. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, this was like the main concern. They saw Afro-Asian Jews as one of their own in some ways. Um, not because of skin tone, although that did play a role, but really just this idea of, uh, you know, being part of a nation, but like completely marginalized by that same nation, right? Being the boundaries of that, and kind of being the, the drawing line, which Afro-Asian Jews often are, right? Between Arab and Jewishness, Black and whiteness for Jewishness. Um, and so a lot of Black Americans just really wanted to learn from this case. <clears throat> so while there, uh, Jiggetts is privy to uh, witness a historical moment in which Jews from a wide ranging, uh, from wide ranging socioeconomic backgrounds, um, but from the global south, um, being largely housed in these tent camps called Mabarot. Um, and she visits tons of them um, and has a interesting time, I'll put it that way. Um, just give me a second. Okay, so Ira Jenkins' picture here, she is one of six children born in North Carolina in 1901 to a music teacher and a reverend. Um, it's through her PhD advisor, Abraham Kach at NYU that she starts becoming interested in the subject of Yemenite Jews. She mostly learns um, through this kind of Orientalism lens, um, but takes her own kind of perspective in some ways, at least outside of her dissertation which is why she called her own memoir, Israel to Me, um, which is quite different from her dissertation, which is kind of Israel filtered through government officials and Abraham Katz, right? Um, and remembering this is 1950s US, uh, she is a black woman. This is a very difficult moment uh, for her in a lot of different ways. So prior to her departure for Israel, um, she recalls that a group photo was taken of all the students, but for some reason, she was deliberately cropped out of the photograph with the exception of her hand, um, which rested on another white student's lap. So there's a little arrow there. That is her hand. This is the young man who um, thankfully was there to have a little bit of uh, eye jiggets in the photo, um, but there is a much more expensive photo that I can't find the original to, but you can see it was quite intentionally cut out um, from the photo and everyone next to her. But once she once the group arrives in Israel, an Israeli photographer asks to take her picture, to which she initially refused. She kept asking, well, why do you want to take my picture? I'm like one of 50 other students. What, what do you care about this? Um, but then eventually the program director from NYU convinced her to take the photo. Um, and it was distributed to newspapers throughout the world, um, where she was kind of lauded as the first Negro at Hebrew U. And from here, we can see on one hand, Jiggis is being intentionally excluded from American society, but on the other, she's being used as a spectacle and marketed, right, um, as a kind of black presence within this, uh, within this newly founded Israel. Um, and this set the tone for how she navigated the complexities of global race relations in particular, and being literally put to the margins at home while being placed at the center outside of home. Um, <clears throat> throughout her memoir, she repeatedly, and I can't emphasize that enough, she repeatedly mentions that she was mistaken for being a Yemenite uh, Jewish woman. Um, while it's really clear how she vocally responded to this at the moment, um, it's interesting to note that for those interpolating her as such, it's something that the physical skin color attributes of Jiggis, as well as her hair texture, um, would confuse her as an African-American woman with Yemenites, just to give an idea of how people are just kind of blindly, you know, kind of uh, painting broad strokes of race there. 
But for her, and she used this um, in a number of her newspaper articles for major black newspapers um, for throughout the 1950s, um, she saw this as a moment of affinity. Um, and she used it as a moment to kind of create solidarity between Black Americans and Afro-Asian Jews in Israel in particular. Um, so here, this is from the Philadelphia uh, Pittsburgh Courier Magazine section, um, one of many uh, articles that she wrote or editorials talking about Israel through the eyes of a Negro uh, woman. And one of the things that she noted throughout these articles was that um, there were a lot of, of course, preconceived notions of, uh, of Afro-Asian Jews, um, and I'm, I'm kind of laughing because a lot of times, you know, in sociology, um, people have these, like, findings, and it's like, yeah, of course, right? <laughs> like, it's like, wow, okay, 50 pages, and then, yeah, I knew that, but, like, at least they proved it, right? <laughs> um, so this is kind of what she's doing here, um, where she interviewed uh, a number of different children, um, and uh, she took note that the least liked among uh, those interviewed in her study were Moroccan and Iraqi Jews. Everyone found them to be violent and despicable, and the most liked were Yemenite Jews, um, particularly because, as she was told repeatedly, um, was that Yemenite Jews had a natural ability to work the land. Unlike the North Africans, um, who were not good, as it was called, human material, for agricultural work. And this really matches up exactly with how Shalush talked about North African Jews. He wanted to find these natural manual laborers um, to build up a land, but then he just saw them as lazy because, oh man, everyone on the coast of North Africa, all the Jews, they're not farmers. I don't understand. Um, and to me, it's kind of weird. You know, I, I like to make this analogy that it's like going on like Schenectady or like, you know, uh, Brooklyn and saying, well, I didn't find any Jewish farmers here. Like they must all be lazy, right? Um, but that kind of epistemic violence, right? Of like erasure and reshaping helped to create this notion that, you know, they should be natural laborers, but since they're not, they're just lazy and violent and a bunch of other things too, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of historical context and like ad lib a little bit here. Um, so throughout her time, she has a bit of a sad story that you know I can talk about in the Q and A if anyone's interested. Um, I find her incredibly interesting. Um, I spent way too much time in my life uh, learning about her and her life. Um, but she creates this kind of image of how Afro-Asian Jews um, were kind of trying to integrate into Israeli society in the 1950s. Um, and then by the 1960s, we have a much more explicit on the part of Afro-Asian Jews themselves engagement with Black American thought, at least or at least Black American rhetoric. So we have something, for instance, um, something from my first book that I found in which people uh, or someone wrote this uh, kind of editorial and they say whiteism breeds blackism. Um, and throughout this, I'll just read it. The days are over when the Orientals, meaning Afro Asian Jews or Sarahim, would gratefully thank their European masters for any little morsel thrown to them in the form of another Uncle Tom and the Knesset. There is growing instead the feeling that we don't want any favors, favors but rather demand what is ours by right. This is not a translation. This is what someone wrote uh, in English uh, in this uh, journal. And it, it just fascinated me that someone would, you know, kind of use this term, Uncle Tom's, you know, European masters, like where are they getting this from, right? Um, clearly they're engaged with Fanon and, and Cesar as well as, you know, probably uh, other black American figures uh, in the 1960s. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, in, 19, uh, in the 1970s, the emergence of the Israeli Black Panthers, um, one of many different, uh, I don't want to call them branches, but many different uh, kind of networks of global Black Panthers. So we have some in Polynesia uh, and the UK, as well as the Dali Panthers and the Indian subcontinent. And then in Israel, um, here we have an image of uh, a group of men uh, burying discrimination. And that's a coffin, it says discrimination. Um, and I think this one on the back 
is meant to say racism, but I kind of forgot. Um, and of course, the black power fist that's put up. Here's another little uh, demonstration there. And then we also see some of the symbolism that is like quite uh, clearly taken in some ways or some form from a black, uh, black American culture. Okay, so after that, or at least after the emergence of the uh, Israeli Black Panthers, we do have this incident which I wanna conclude on, um, which I kind of question in my mind, is it kind of a back to Africa movement in some ways? Um, and we get a sense from Israel themselves um, how they perceive their own concept of blackness and how they position themselves within global blackness. <clears throat> So, sorry, I'm just trying not to sneeze. That's <laughs> what's going on right now, <laughs> and I'm struggling, but it's, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, so there is within the Black Panthers uh, in Israel, uh, notably in 1974, 1975, uh, people like Shalom Cohen and Dan Israel, uh, the latter who was disappeared, um, both of which took tours of Europe and kind of made this argument, particularly for French Jews who were primarily from North Africa at the time, um, to actually consider, you know, creating some kind of solidarity movement between brethren, right? Moroccans getting together transnationally, Moroccan Jews at least, um, and thinking about issues of blackness and race uh, within the Jewish community and outside of the Jewish community. Um, some even went as far as to call for uh, uh, this kind of assistance for Afro-Asian Jews to migrate from Israel in particular. And interestingly enough, members of the Arab League took heed of these calls. Um, for my immigration and migration and led a campaign from 1975 to 1978 to invite Jews, Israeli Jews in particular, um, um, from places like Morocco, Sudan, Egypt, Yemen, and Iraq to return for, to their rightful homeland in the Arab world. And this is one example. Uh, this is an advertisement that the Revolutionary Command Council of Iraq placed in the New York Times. They also had a few in the Toronto Star and a couple in uh, uh, French newspapers as well. Um, while it's kind of a seemingly absurd notion that Jews, for instance, will return to Baghdad under Saddam Hussein, who would return to Baghdad under Saddam Hussein? <laughs> would be a great question. People actually did it. Um, this actually happened. Um, and the war, one of the more infamous uh, instances of that was uh, that of Yosef Nawi and Dawid or Dawud Moruk, um, both Iraqi Israelis. Um, from peripheral towns in Israel um, who returned to Iraq under the Ba'ath regime. In 1976, uh, Nawi, I don't know why that happened. Is this a uh, sign? Yeah, no, open the uh, Sleep. Stop. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yep, there you go. There we go. Perfect. Great. Oh, no. no? Oh. oh, no, there it is. There it is. Yeah. So I have to give it a second. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, now we uh, flew to Iraq uh, along with um, his immediate family. Um, and while there, he immediately gave a press conference in. I will just leave the picture on this. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that will do it. Yeah. Uh, he immediately gave a press conference uh, in Baghdad, uh, which the New York Times reported on and Washington Post as well, um, where he denounced the treatment of Afro-Asian Jews in particular, using the term Israhim or uh, the Eastern Jews, as it would have been called in Arabic, um, particularly in regard to institutionalized racism. Um, that he pointed out existed in Israel. And so this is kind of a big deal, right? You know, it's just not something that is even to this day really discussed as institutionalized racism within Israel for the Jewish community at least. Um, a few years later, uh, Dawud uh, Mordoch appeared on the Iraqi uh, Baghdad uh, radio explaining that he returned also to Iraq after spending several years living in um, the Zionist hell that is Israel, as he called it. Um, and 
He expressed his appreciation for being able to return to his Jewish homeland of Iraq. Um, just a really cool nerdy comment uh, is that I found uh, more Luke's uh, transcript of the Iraqi Jewish archives, which the uh, American uh, occupation forces, uh, you know, kind of took and moved to DC. Um, this is a copy of it. This is like one of the best pages. The rest of them are like little bitty pieces uh, of like paper that I had to like kind of put together and figure out where the words were. Um, and this is a picture of Yusuf and Dorit uh, Noe, um, who were the first who came in at the time. When reporters asked about, at least for um, Moroccan Jews, why would you go back to Morocco? Didn't you leave there? Didn't we save you? Um, there's this really fascinating quote uh, by a name, uh, uh, man named Albert, who says that we've had enough of this country. 28 years we put up with you, Ashkenazim, and we didn't become affluent from uh, the riots. He's referring now to White Salid Rebellion in 1959 and the emergence of the Israeli Black Panthers um, that the Blacks did against the Whites. So now we're saying, thanks, that's enough. We're going back to Morocco. On top of that, he also started talking about a white regime ruling over a black class of people. Um, and this is, uh, to me at least, fascinating, primarily because we have this kind of longer history of black Americans and me being a black American and Jewish American. Um, I find it fascinating of like, you know, thinking about engaging with Israel in particular, not through the conflict, right, of Israel, Pal uh, Israel Palestinian conflict, but through the lens of uh, Jewish racial divisions, right? Um, and this is how people saw it at the time, right? Um, and so kind of thinking of that as something that's black and white, but not black and white, um, is, is a really different way of approaching Israeli history. Um, and this case in particular, at least for Afro-Asian Jews, teaches us um, a lot about how the question of blackness and what it looks like, who possesses it, um, how it functions, can and has shifted throughout time and place. And when we explicitly engage with black thought, we can find more nuanced understandings of the situation of Israel in particular, who prior to their mass migration to Israel-Palestine, we're not in the least bit considered black, maybe by some communities, or at least the home she lives, for instance. Um, but once they got to Israel, they became black in a way um, and actually embraced that terminology as a means of empowerment for themselves. Um, and then later, of course, with the migration of Beta Israel Jews, um, which I won't discuss because of time, um, that, that notion of blackness shifted in some ways, at least from this cartoon here on the on the left shifted from Afro-Asian Jews to Ethiopian Jews in particular. So here we have uh, two men who are marked, and this is my kind of concluding things uh, as a kind of conversation starter. There are two men who are marked in different ways as Mizrahi. Um, and the one on the right says, once we were the uh, oppressed blacks here, and then the other one with the cigarette in his mouth says, yeah, and so the Ethiopians came to screw this over. Um, and in the background, we have presumably uh, Ethiopian Jews, Israelis who are saying down with this, enough with discrimination um, and protesting against racism. And so that major question still in my mind, and also I think in a lot of Israeli minds are, well, who are the blacks now, right? Um, and if Ethiopian Jews are the black community of Jews, in Israel now, where is that place of uh, Mizrahi Jews in particular? Um, are they fighting with each other? Is there conflict between that? Or are they on the same page, which unfortunately is not the case, but maybe it will be in the future. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and kind of open it up for questions. Uh, Thank you all. So, <laughs> Wonderful, yay! And then we have some Zoom questions as well. Oh, All great, right. okay. I don't see those. I just see you, actually. Okay. Just have that Because nobody's on video. Oh, so. that's why, okay. So, um, you didn't talk about the the different divisions, even in, in among European Jews, because even there, there were the Blacks, right? The, mm -hmm. the Central and, yeah, the Central and Eastern Jews, Eastern European Jews are the black mm -hmm. Jews, right? And Nicole Trotsa, 
they're called blacks um, and they're not smart they're disgusting and smelly and not educated so every time you move to a different environment and new people come in they're blacks but mm. i don't know i mean they the the moroccans adopted this this um american notion of black but that wasn't i don't think that was the meaning of the ashkenazi ashkenazi calling people black right they're more more of a kind of dirty people right like like gypsies are dirty you know? yeah gypsies. i mean i would say more like gypsies in some ways but uh, what i will say is that why i would say that uh, so one hand i would not say that uh, Ms. Rafain kind of adopted the American notion. Uh, one, because I think it's um, something that many people automatically do assume that if we talk about blackness and whiteness or racism, mm -hmm. that it's like American centric. And that's not the case in the least bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how I see like Afro Asian Jews as like um, having this long global black history. Is because there was a vested interest of Central Europeans, particularly German Jews, mm -hmm. um, to become white, right? Mm -hmm. um, which starts in like the mid to late 19th century. Yeah. Um, and in doing so, um, there is this kind of, uh, you know, creating scholarship to blacken Eastern, Eastern European Jews or Eastern Jews in general, right? So, so what do you mean by black? Then? So a lot of times when, um, uh, when so Arthur Rubin, for instance, when he when he talks about both in his dissertation, but then also later in his writings, um, when he tries to figure out, okay, what is the origins of the Jewish race? Where is the Jewish race placed? He creates this disgusting but interesting chart um, where <laughs> he has like you know the Alpine races, really the white, the yellow, and the Negroid races, uh -huh. um, and. Uh, Jews are distinctly within the white category, mm -hmm. except for Yemenite Jews who are like kind of at the bottom and they're more closer to the Negroid races. Mm -hmm. And he goes on in this really long diatribe about why um, both uh, Eastern European Jews, uh, or as Polish Jews in particular, Yemenite Jews and North African Jews are um, have too much uh, Negro blood, as he put it, or mm -hmm. Negro blood. Um, and he says it's because, well, you know, during the medieval period, uh, Eastern European Jews, they mixed up with the slaves, mm -hmm. whatever that means. <laughs> and uh, that's how they like have, that's why they have these physical features of blackness. Mm -hmm. um, using a lot of these um, uh, race cards, as I call them, uh, to show like a, a Galician Jew or Eastern European Jew looking like a Negro. Um, and juxtaposing those two images. And so there was this really, and it, what that did, it wasn't just like, you know, just being racist for racist sake. What it did was show that, no, 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 no. We're not like them. We being German Jews, right? Um, yeah. To a lesser extent, French Jews. Um, we're not like them. We're the white ones. Um, they just had too much mixing with the rest, mm -hmm. right? And that changed uh, significantly after uh, the Second World War or obvious reasons um but it was still okay for people to do that same thing for north african or african and asian jews in particular um there's this really fascinating um uh, uh, short pamphlet um written by an indian jewish woman um who talks about this and is having this conversation with the um it's based off of the american jewish yearbook of 1911 i believe um, where she talks about how people are conceptualizing um, uh, non-Central European Jews as Black and why that's so problematic. And she's pointing these things out that like really is just kind of meant to, that's a conversation for them. And she's kind of saying, keep my name out your mouth uh, mm -hmm. in many ways, right? Um, and so I think it's, it, you know, it, it, it's something that um, for the most part, um, prior to the 1950s, Jews in Africa and Asia weren't really part of that conversation, but they were still very much kind of like being driven in people's mindset that, oh yeah, these are the black ones, we're the white ones, right? And to have that kind of like black foil mm -hmm. um, to juxtapose their own whiteness, um, or at least to bolster their own whiteness was very useful. Mm -hmm. um, as an example, to give to non-Jews, to give to Particularly non-just whites. I would and say. It, it was their way of integrating. Yep. Yeah. 
um, either in Germany or in the US, right? Um, and then, I mean, for Israel and Palestine, it's a curious thing, right? You know, well, who are they trying to prove this to? Uh, I mean, we kind of know, but like, it's like, but why? Right. Um, that's what kind of fascinates me. Why is there still this vested interest of like having Israel be seen as a white country? Right. Uh, we even have, you know, uh, what's his face um, from Shas, uh kind of being yeah, intentionally. Yeah. And he's shy, yeah. <laughs> I'm being oh, intentionally. Yeah. Right, so he so looks so like a Nazi. <laughs> he dresses up as a Nazi. Yeah, yeah, he does. Right. But he's, he's a brown man. Right. His skin tone is well, brown. But but the the head the the intellectual head of that of the of Shaz, right? He was Iraqi and he looked so Iraqi. The way he dressed, he dressed like a medieval Iraqi guy. Right? He had this weird hat and these, these capes. I mean he well, didn't that's even good. look so that's part partially that's like kind of like you know returning the crown to his former glory right. of the yeah. chief rabbinate just being you know, uh, Spartan. yeah, the Spartan one, right? Yeah. Um, and Ishai is a Tunisian man, and he had this uh, uh, interesting, kind of fascinating quote uh, in reference to uh, uh, asylum seekers um, from Africa mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, where he said, they need to realize this is white, the white man's country here. He said that? He said that, yeah. <laughs> they, an African man, <laughs> like from Tunisia, um, with brown skin, uh, said that they need to realize this is the white man's land here. And they can't just go around, uh, you well, know, I mean, changing that. They also say similar things about Arabs and they are Arabs. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, you know, there's, you know, there's this continued vested interest of like kind of creating or bolstering whiteness for Jews. And we really have to kind of come to terms with why are we doing that, you know, and, and how far does that go? Like, you know, how much are we doing that really, right? Because I think it's much more uh, deeply embedded than we would like to imagine or at least admit in some ways. Yeah. Um, and then what's going on with that? So that's fine, yeah. Uh, yes. So I'm just going to ask a question in the chat and just the chat a little bit. Um, so you use the category of Mizrahim and Ashkenazim at the beginning, but some people were asking the question, where does Fardim fit in this broader mix? And mm -hmm. then I would like to push it one, one further, is do you see any differentiation within uh, the, the Mizrahim himself? Because I know Jews from Morocco who uh, are of varied skin tones and identify with different groups of Jews from Morocco and there are subdivisions even within that categorization. So how do you wrap that? Kind of diversity landscape, and then how do you connect that with Sephardim as a category itself? And it's usage. yeah. I mean, so I mean, to start off with uh, the Sephardic community, like really, this, we're talking about Western, uh, like Western European Iberian Peninsula Jews who, you know, were expelled 1492, 1496. I mean, that's like the definition, right? Um, and I think in the anglophone world there can be this kind of um unintentional mixture of the two assuming that all non european jews are sephardic in that sense right um using this catch-all term similar to how mizrahi operates um so that's one thing and that, that's pretty problematic um uh, but it's there um and then in terms of how do we uh kind of like uh, categorize or kind of map out the differences between the Mizrahi community in Israel, um, largely speaking. Uh, I'll start off by saying that uh, the Jewish world has a, a fairly uh, distinct or unique way of mapping on racial difference um, that doesn't actually work out in any other place, right? Um, so we, we talk about Jews from Bukhara or from uh, Samarkand, right? Uh, these are people from the former Soviet Union that we see, we being like, let's say, Israeli Jews, would see as part of the Mizrahi world in some one, one shape or form, right? Not Ashkenazi, even though they're from the former Soviet Union or Georgia Jews, right? Um, and a lot of that, I think, has to do with this proximity to uh, Christendom in some ways or proximity to Islam that it's kind of like, well, if you're closer to Christian Christianity or Christian culture and world, then you're Ashkenazi. If you're not, then you're the rest, right? 
Um, and then to kind of answer that question about um, the Moroccan community, of course, you know, there are um, Amazigh Jews, uh, I would not like to use the term Berber, but I know that's much more known, um, but indigenous Jews from North Africa, um, or Amazigh, uh, and then there's, of course, the Sephardic, Spanish, Portuguese community, um, with various different skin tones, right, um, who have been historically and still are very, very distinct from each other, right? Um, and I think what happens, which is kind of an interesting thing that we should take as a lesson to teach other fields, is that when people migrate, a lot of the kind of categories um, that distinguish them ends up being flat. And then in some ways, you kind of become what you hate it, right? Um, so the Bahotsim, like the kind of uh, 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 the Spanish exiles, right, were very, very distinct within Morocco, or what is now Morocco, um, from the other remaining communities. And the Namazic communities were kind of denigrated. Mm -hmm. um, but then now if we think about Moroccan Jews in Israel, one of the main like kind of slurs that was used was shlohim, right? Mm -hmm. The shloh community of the Amazigh. It's a it's a tribe, you know, um, of Jews, uh, not Jews, but you know, it's a tribe of Amazigh people. Um, and that's like now just kind of a catch-all term for all Moroccans, or at least a de derogatory one. Um, and all of that stuff gets flat. Um, in some ways, or in many ways. And, that, and that's kind of, I mean, I find it fascinating, but I think it's something that happens a lot of different times where we imagine that like, or we, we have these like very, very serious hi hierarchical structures um, that are super important to us. But then like, let's say we take, you know, all the American Jews and place us somewhere else. They were all just a bunch of Americans which is kind of what happens in Israel, right? <laughs> right? Uh, we're just a bunch of Anglos uh, in, in, in some ways. Um, although the racial distinctions still have its, you know, uh, place and uh, kind of influence. Um, a lot of those identities get flat. I think that answers that question. Okay, great. Uh, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Brian. This is phenomenal. It was like so much to talk about it. We have to talk a lot about this later. Yes. Um, I, I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier, because it was something that I was thinking about throughout your entire presentation, which is the status of Palestinian mm. in this framework, yeah. which is to say that you started out your presentation by talking about the terminology of racism, right? When it, it seems pretty clear that, you know, like you're talking about issues within the Israeli sort of Jewish sphere. There's also all sorts of non-Jews within Israel mm -hmm. as well. You know, like you mentioned, also like the refugees from Sudan. You know, also like what about like um, like migrant workers coming from Thailand and other places in, in Southeast Asia? You know, so I, I guess part of the question is like, to what extent is the framework that you're developing here for talking about Israeli Jews also help us to understand Israeli society as well as the uh, occupied territory is kind of on a much broader level? And then the other half of it, you know, sort of something that you referenced earlier, you talked about this idea. Of you know Israeli Jews kind of seeing it as like you call it the white man's country, right? You know <laughs> I didn't know no at least I no I don't you you're recording it right you're recording <laughs> yeah, yeah. it um, to be clear right but the question is like you're talking also about a number of like historical cases and sort of how this is over the course of time but this is a, a very present issue mm -hmm. as we're trying to understand sort of the place of Israel within the discourse about global whiteness. Right. And, yeah. and, and the sort of struggle against depression on a global scale. Yeah. So like, how is it the understanding the kind of shifting motion, you said like the, the, the blackness in motion mm -hmm. helps us to understand kind of the shifting place of Israel on a global scene as well? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, those are really great questions. Oh man, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna like struggle to answer them, but I will try to answer them. <laughs> so I'll start off with saying that, okay, um, I mean, I know one major uh, issue that I face is that I don't talk about Palestinians mm -hmm. uh, very much in, in the book. Um, there's, there's kind of a, there is a reason for that. Um, and that's primarily because, um, although I can't articulate it very well at this moment, um, what I will say is that I see blackness as something that ends up being constructed within a nation state boundary. Um, and for Palestinians, that's a different society. Right, um, either diasporic uh, Palestinian communities or those in occupied territories or those within uh, the state of Israel, right? Um, and within Palestinian society, there's a serious issue of anti-Afro-Arab 
myths, right? Uh, Anti-blackness within the Arab world and at large, right? In North Africa, in the Levant, um, of those who were either descendants of previous, uh, those who were enslaved or those with, you know, were Afro-Arabs, right? Um, in similar ways to other black communities. And so it would make it, I would find it incredibly difficult um, and downright problematic to just kind of make a blanket statement of saying that, okay, well, um, Israel presents itself as white, and so it's white. Um, Israeli, uh, Israel as a Jewish uh, democratic state um, <laughs> sees itself as white, and so it is white. Um, and then uh, Palestine or future Palestine is brown or black um, because that's how a lot of Americans see it in that case. That's just not true, right? right? Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, and I don't know what to do with that um, in some ways. I mean, that's just like my honest take is I don't know what to do with that other than, um, which is what I do do is kind of like point out to those who, um, including Palestinian activists that like, hey, I'm trying to clean up my house. Can you also work on cleaning up yours in terms of the treatment of Afro-Palestinians? Right, because um, there's some serious issues there, um, especially in the Bedouin community, I will say in the South, um, and then how they're treated um, within Israel in general is, you know, is there. Okay, um, and then you ask something else about uh, Israel on a global scale and kind of whiteness. You kind of already addressed it. Did time. I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I feel like I'm missing something. Can do this. Yeah, I think there are questions. Oh, okay, all right. Kind of tossed a whole bunch of different things out there. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I love those questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I sufficiently answered them, but uh, I, it makes me sweat, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so we've got another one from the chat. Uh, I'd like to know whether any of the early work or current work has taken into account the experience of serving the Army. Since that in practice has been most effective way for many kinds of outsiders to feel included in Israeli nationalism. Yeah, I mean, it can and it cannot, right? Um, so wait, are they asking about my work? In particular? Your work or just in general, what role, what role maybe perhaps do you see the army playing in sort of aligning or addressing uh, these questions of racial differentiation? Yeah, so I would say that the uh, the state and the army sees itself uh, uh, sees the army as a great integration mechanism or mechanism for integration. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say it is a fantastic tool of uh, co-optation in some ways of nationalism. Um, whereas uh, Ethiopian Jews, even uh, the uh, Black Hebrew Israelites, in some ways, uh, the, uh, African American community of a cult-ish uh, community um, has also kind of like embraced some aspects of, uh, of Zionist nationalism uh, through the army. Um, and so in, in that sense, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it integration, but I would say it does help people to learn how to, at least in their rhetoric, uh, embrace uh, nationalism. That being said, um, for the periods that I've mostly focused on, which is um, 49 to 79, um, for the longest period of time, those who were um, kind of uh, refusers, those who refused to serve in the army, were primarily Afro-Asian Jews. Um, and people kind of forget that. Um, until the 70s, that was the case. Um, they were derided for uh, and, and not called in the same ways that we call uh, people who refuse in the army now. Um, and by the 70s, or at least late 70s, that kind of shifted towards the more Ashkenazi uh, middle and upper class communities of um, individuals uh, kind of embracing this refusal to serve in the army. Um, and, th and that was seen as more of a kind of intellectual uh, you know, conscientious objection, um, as opposed to uh, a bunch of delinquents who just didn't want to or were too lazy to, right? And so really, I think, you know, um, future work um, in looking at uh, the army as an integration mechanism should really, uh, really, really delve into this earlier period of time in the 50s and 60s in which, like, the majority of people who were, like, either having kind of passive resistance um, while being in the army or active
active resistance of like saying, no, I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm going to run away. Um, we're mostly Afro Asian Jews and actually kind of thinking through that. What does that mean for um, this concept of the army being an integration mechanism? Or what does that mean for even Zionism itself, right? Um, Zionism, Israeli Zionism. So, what does that mean for that? Yes. Cool. I, uh, thanks. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about another identity category that didn't get that, you, that is kind of I feel in the air a little bit, and that is Arabness. So, if um, so fascinating to think about Misachim um, in the context of Black Panthers, and I wonder just how much in, in the stark dichotomy in that like Israeli, let's say Hebrew speaking mindset that they're Yehudim and all of being mm. Jews and Arabs. If, if the Mizrahi identity um, is black, how much does is their Arabness or lack of Arabness affect, um, at play there? Um, and I guess I'm asking, do they, in order to be black, do you have to not be Arab? In that context? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, no, I would say absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think those, those two, two are. are and they, yeah, they can very much be part of each other. Um, what I will say is that why I don't talk about Arabness for Mizrahim is that, like, if we think about everyone who's thrown into the category of Mizrahi, uh, Israeli, most are not Arab, right? Mm -hmm. Even when we talk about like the countries of North Africa and Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, um, you know, a good chunk of uh, of the Jewish communities there are not Arab. They're Amazigh, they're Sephardic, mm -hmm. uh, although probably the majority or at least the kind of hegemon uh, of the Jewish community would be Arab. There's still, you know, that sense. And then including Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, Singapore, <laughs> these, the Baghdadi Jewish community, uh, which is a large diasporic community of, of multitudes of cultures and communities um, that are not all Arab. And I think, you know, to um, this is kind of like maybe a little bit provocative, but I would say like to say Mizrahi equals Arab Jew is to do the same work of uh, of what Zionism does and kind of like, and also Arab nationalism does in dividing Jewishness and Arabness, right? It's really just kind of like flattening these identities, creating an epistemic uh, violence of erasure of like the nuances and the complexities of these various different Jewish cultures and saying, oh yeah, yeah they're all Arab or they're all Jewish, right? In the same way and kind of forgetting that, no, these are peoples and communities with long detailed histories, of beautiful cultures um that are not just or not you know not just era um not just african but all of these things together right um and you know uh, for jewish studies which is I'm, I'm very invested in you know i think we have a lot of work to do in writing those histories of you know uh jewish communities everywhere um at least outside of europe because we can make a we can make a distinction pretty easily between let's say most you the you know Jews and things like that, but when we talk about Moroccan Jews, it's like whoa, wait, what? <laughs> which uh, which community are you talking about here? You know, um, the Spanish speaking, the Hakatia speaking, the Amazigh, the you know Tanaan speaking. So yeah, that's yeah. You see where my rent is going? Yeah, thank you <laughs> for confirming. <laughs> yes. Um, so I do want to continue on what Jason, um, Jason's question in terms of, so I understand why you're not going into Palestinian issues, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering how, you know, there was some, especially in the late 70s, there were some, you know, Mizrahi activists who did draw connections between their struggle and the Palestinian struggle, mm -hmm. you know, especially parts of the Black Panthers who also either joined, um, you know, the Hadash and the Communist Party, which was basically Arab and Palestinian. Yeah. So how does, how and if does that fit in your framework of, of thinking through Blackness? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I'm, oh wait, hang on. It's not following me anymore. <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm trying to be, you know, very cognizant. Yeah, it just, it's not following me. So I'll just, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of struggling at the moment uh, with this chapter on the Black Panthers, primarily because of the general relationship to Palestinian uh, citizens and non-citizens at the time. 
you know, there's this like, you know, infamous incident of like a um, Palestinian student who uh, in Tel Aviv who asked, you know, to join the Black Panthers. There was this big discussion, like, can we let this person in? I don't know, you know, yeah, they're kind of fighting the same struggle. And the conclusion was, no, 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 no. If you wanna, you know, if you wanna join us, do your own thing, right? Um, which is kind of a similar take to what was going on, uh, at least in the Oakland chapter of the Black Panthers here, of like with whites, um, which is very different from the Chicago chapter, like uh, understanding. And, but on the other hand, what was going on, at least in my, in my thinking, of why they denied this person membership was because it would look bad. Um, it would not be as immediately acceptable for those who are, you know, very much um, invested in Zionism. If you started letting in, you know, the rest, right? Um, and that gets at that tension of what's going on, at least in terms of uh, Israeli Jewish blackness, of that, like, we do have to remember that, like, um, you know, not all, you know, black thought is emancipatory or liberating, right? Uh, I think we kind of forget that sometimes. We imagine that, you know, um, radical black thought is always going to be progressive and leftist. And no, oh, I mean, <laughs> take a look around this country, right? <laughs> and like who, you know, uh, the history of that kind of thing. And so, um, and to say that actually allows for a much more uh, human human take uh, of understanding blackness. It's not just this essential category of like, um, all black thought is liberatory. There's also a lot of like, uh, excuse the term, backwardsness, right? Uh, within global black thought uh, in that sense. And so where do I see, I feel like I'm like dancing around an answer and I kind of forgot what your question was. <laughs> I had like a major answer. I was like, no, I know what it is. And I kind of forgot. I just, it's fine. I just asked like, where do you see actually, you know, alliances or connections being made between the Israeli struggle and the Palestinian struggle? Mm. For example, you did show um, in one of the slides, uh, the Black Panthers got published in Matspan, mm -hmm. which was a radical leftist right. anti-Zionist organization yep. of Jews. Yes. So, so yes. And how does that fit into your, if and how does that fit? It doesn't have to fit into your- Yeah, system. yeah, no, no. Yeah. Um, so, uh, spoiler alert, I'm a pessimist. Um, and so I would like to say it was a brief moment in time that we had this kind of uh, Mizrahi Palestinian solidarity, at least to the Panthers. Um, there was significant things going on in the background. For instance, the first meetings with the PLO of Israeli Jews were Mizrahi Jews, Latif Dori, being notably the first one. Although, um, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on this. I can picture his face. I mean, you know, uh, big leftists considered the first person who, first Israeli Jew to have met with the PLO. An Ashkenazi man was considered. Uh, maybe, maybe Moses? No, no. Uh, White beard? Boy of Nelly? No. 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 <laughs> okay, no, no. Let's not do this now. <laughs> I'll remember at some point and I'll, it'll just pop in my mind. Um, uh, but, you know, that's all to say, you know, um, Mizrahi Jews were meeting, you know, in Europe with members of the PLO without, you know, without making a stake you know, actually creating like a lot of dialogue um, about what is, you know, what is a future peace meant to look like in the region. Um, but that's not part of like the historical narrative, right? Um, and it doesn't interest me that much, that kind of political realm of that. So I don't talk about it so much, but I think it's something, you know, important to kind of think through about, well, why is it that when we think about uh, who was, when was the first time the Israelis met with Palestinian officials? We, we think of, uh, you know, the Camp David, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those kind of things, rather than uh, these kind of like uh, marginalized communities of people meeting with each other, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So I wanted, I actually have kind of two questions. Um, and thank you for giving us so much to think about and talk about a lot of really wonderful things. Um, that came out of your talk. But I wanted to revisit the question. I think it's related to what Italia just asked and also to the question that Benny asked about, um, about Arabs and Arab identity. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I, I, I completely understand your point about, well, they're not all Arabs, so why should we call them? We're doing that same kind of violence by lumping them all into. But I think that if we think about Arabness as a category that is in some ways comparable to the way that you're talking about Blackness, mm -hmm. that is that it's not sort of literally inscribed on the body, but something that can be taken up um, as the basis for activism, as the basis for um, pushing back against certain norms um, and, and against discrimination, as the basis to forge alliances with Palestinians, for instance. We see a lot of Mizrahi activists mm -hmm. who have done exactly that. And they're less concerned with the specifics of, well, I'm Moroccan, so am I Sephardic or am I actually Arab? And actually embracing this idea of, of Arabness as, as activism. Right? And I wonder if you could say something about that, but I just also want to quickly ask a, a quick second question. Yeah. But I don't know if, um, if we have time for all of it. But the second question was since we're talking about the discourse of race and talking about how some of the discourse of race from the US was applied in Israel, looking at the contemporary situation, I wonder if, there, if you've identified anything akin to the anti-racism that we talk about so much in the US in recent years. Um, if there's anything like that that's come up, because a lot of times the rhetoric and the discourse is kind of adopted in terms of social justice protests that happened in Israel in the last few years, for mm -hmm. example, um, and Me Too and all of these movements, and they take their cue from the U.S. I wonder if you've seen anything like that with anti-racism. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'd say, you know, um, there was this really great uh series i don't know i can't remember where it came from maybe it's from the name um but there's a series on youtube i don't know if you ever encounter this i i was also there it's um it, it's video clips of women um from various mostly non-ashkenazi israeli backgrounds um and also lots of palestinian women we're talking about um being survivors um in various different scenarios and they like tell their stories it's so fascinating because it also you know, it's, you know, talking about gender violence, but it's very clear from like, you know, how they're talking, who's talking and who you see, the scenarios that they're mentioning, that this is also like a kind of anti-racist rhetoric that's going on. And it's like based around the Me Too, you know, movement in that sense. Um, in addition to that, um, there is um, a lot of uh, poetry and, and music in particular, um, where you do have that um, kind of, um, uh, organically built uh, anti-racism activism within uh, the kind of non-European origin Jewish communities uh, in Israel, I would say. Does that kind of answer that second question? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, now, the first one was... Just... About the category of Arabness. Yeah, the category of Arabness. So here's my concern, again, uh, and like, you know, just make sure that we're all on the same page and I'm answering your question, um, is that I'm thinking, so yeah, I get that, particularly in the contemporary of the past 20 years, right, 20, 30 years, where like Arabness for Israeli Jews uh, of Mizrahi origin can be this category that's not tied into, you know, uh, the body or to Arabness per se, but then historically speaking, um, you know, uh, as someone who's like very much invested in the history of North Africa, I'm always thinking, well, you know, the Amazigh movement, um, you know, that's still going on today, sees Arabness as a colonial power, right, as a colonial hegemon, which in their light makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and so that same erasure can happen for Jewish communities that are part of those things, right? And so to say like, okay, well, yeah, the category, the category of Arabness, um, at least in this context, um, uh, can be broadened um, as a way of uh, liberation. That makes sense, yes. Um, but I think what's really important to do is to really think about the time and space in which we're kind of like thinking through these issues, right? In which um, that works probably the past 20, 30 years in the region of the Levant. Um, wouldn't work, let's say, 1980s, 1970s for Jews in Lebanon, right? Uh, or Christians in Lebanon of Arabness, right? That is like very much antagonistic to what was going on for them. Um, 
and that's the same kind of thing for blackness, right? Where like, you know, in certain contexts or in, it, it really is time and space dependent where like, you know, if I threw the category of blackness onto uh, Ottoman Sephardic Jews in Palestine, that makes absolutely no sense, right? Um, for that time and space, but that definitely makes sense for the time and space of, you know, 1940s Israel or 1940s Palestine and then 1940s Israel and Palestine later on. Um, so yeah, I think that's really something that we kind of really need to think through um, is that when we talk about these issues, we really have to like actually say, okay, this is the time and place and space that I'm like considering that this category makes sense to use in. Um, and getting away from this idea of authenticity, I think is also very useful because then a lot of kind of, uh, kind of uh, counterpoints that some would make for activists, uh, Mizrahi activists in Israel nowadays is that like, oh, they're not really being authentic. They're just, you know, kind of, you know, reminiscing about something that never happened and things like that. But no, they're creating something that's useful for their framing in that time and space. And I think that's worthwhile to like, you know, and legitimate to do. Well, we're very much at time and uh, uh, yes. <laughs> grateful for Professor Roby for his, his wonderful presentation and his entertaining so many uh, questions <laughs> and such. Uh, Jim and Zinger, we really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you. And those of you on Zoom, thank you for being here, and uh, we hope that you have a wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs>